Morinosuke Kawaguchi is Japan's foremost futurist, a leading innovation and competitive strategy consultant, author, and designer. He is the founder and CEO of Morinosuke Company Limited, a creative future laboratory based in Tokyo. His approach to Japanese subculture and how it comprises a competitive advantage in R&D has made him popular in Japan. Morinosuke became well known after the launch of his book, Otaku de Ononoko Nakuni no Monozukuri, or in English, Geeky Girly Innovation, earning the prestigious Nikkei BP BizTech Book Award in 2008. More recently, he has written the book Megatrends 2016 to 2025, in Japanese, in which he outlines 50 trends in nine fields like communication between real and virtual and artificial ecology and human enhancement. As advisor to the Japanese government, Morinosuke Kawaguchi is helping to create the country's strategy for the future up to 2030, as well as advising some of the world's largest multinationals. He is also a sought-after keynote speaker at innovation forums and international conferences both in Japan and abroad. Yahoo Japan listed his TEDx Tokyo Toilet Talks as one of the world's top five presentations. Okay, today's topic is a uh, man machine interface. So when you hear the word man machine interface, what comes to your mind? Is for some of you guys probably this kind of high tech gadget, like a smart glasses or smart watches kind of thing, right? But let me begin the story with the ancestors of those very common products around us. These are the original product original first production model of these three items from the achievement of the technology from the previous centuries. And here is the brief summary of this history of the pair of glasses and a typewriter and a wristwatch. Overall, looking at this kind of design, you know, it's almost completed from the beginning. It's not so much different from the modern glasses or the watches or anything, right? This Remington number one was the first typewriter. We still use the keyboard, same. Or this Cartier's Santos. This is the first made wrist watch. Before that, it was the pocket watch. First made by the Cartier. Santos is still the famous, you know, the, the modern line of this, you know, premium Cartier's watch business, right? The more detailed story about the glasses. You know, this optical glass idea here was invented more than 1,000 years ago. We knew the lens. But it took more than 500 years to downsize thin enough and light enough to be carried, to carry on. You know, more you know, recent terminology is called probably mobile. Mobile glass appear. But after that, we still had to wait like 300, 400 years to be the complete wearable with this temple structure here, hooking on the ear, right? So this glass was, became small enough by the technology, but it took such a long time to get a citizenship on the surface of the face. You know, imagine because this is uh, just an inorganic material, metal, and the glasses are trying to hooking on the face, but uh, you know, to get the citizenship, this mental barrier was so strong. And we had to spend 300 years, 400 years. So was the wristwatch. You know, around this 17th, 18th century, this minimizing technology, you know, this precision engineering was so hot in Britain or the Netherlands. And it came from the wall to the desktop, and it immediately downsized enough to the pocket. But again, it took almost another 300 years to be hanging on the wrist. It was already small enough, but people never thought of you know, wearing it constantly. 
This, as I mentioned, this Cartier de Santos is the first production model. Actually, this Santos is the name of person, Brazilian guy. He's well known as the father of the aviation industry in Brazil. And his friend, the Cartier, made it for, the, for, for Santos because he was a pilot. So hands-free piloting is necessary for this life issue, life security issue. And at that time, this far first world war car, and it, this invention was really appreciated by these soldiers or the pilot for the purpose of this survival. So the motivation to, to get this, you know, the position leap of this small, small enough the mechanism from the pocket and they replace it onto the wrist, was this, you know, such a strong motivation we needed. Life security issue, survival. For survival, we reluctantly move it to here, not for cool looking or not for convenience. That much mental barrier is so big. So the learning from these two wearable gadgets we are using, you know, commonly, is both the technology was essentially necessary to downsize enough and to make it mobile. But again, this 200, 400 years, they had to wait to get the trace on the surface of the skin. And the technology people usually underestimate this kind of psychological part of the human being. So do not underestimate. That what, can, what we can learn about this fact is do not underestimate this liberal art part of this innovation too. The next topic is the typewriter. What we can learn from it is Remington number one. This is the first production model. And since then, it's same. It's completely same. This keyboard, even this layout of the square layout is still same from the beginning. So nothing changed, it looks like. So that did change the aspect to look at this. Remington number one is how to use by the user. The, the, the designer of this Remington number one thought the, uh, we human being would use this complicated structure by two fingers. But 15 years later, after the release of this production model to the market, this touch key was discovered. Wow, we can use you know, 10 fingers at the same time and without looking at it. That was a sensation. We can do this. And then look at this. It's so, so excited, people. This is this uh, secretary's competition in America. So they are so proud how much they can do it. So imagine if you were the designer, first designer of this Remington number one, you could never even imagine we, we, we can do this. Now it's no, nobody wonder, but you know, that, that was the huge impact. So what we can learn from this is our redundancy or the flexibility of manipulating the machine is beyond the imagination of the poor engineer's mind. So as piano typing abacus, it looks like so complicated, but once it's on the field of the user, some of the art level of the user can manipulate this machine, complicated interface, beyond the level of this designer's imagination. That's how powerful we can operate the machine. Here is a typical example of this ultra high-speed Japanese typing system. This is the simpler keyboard. It's so much less number of the keyboard, and we operate only seven keys in each hand. We don't even move this hand, it's just stationary. But extremely fast, you know, the performance we can get. How come? We, we memorize 3,000 basic combinations for the basic expressions. Then we can do, achieve this much fast, you know, typing. It's not like typing like this, it's like the it's like a machine language she's you know, pushing. So this shows how much we can be the part of the machine too. It's like a cyborg, right? So what a difficult interface is, we can overcome 
the performance is. It's becoming more difficult, but once we can play the piano, it's great music you can play. It's like that. So this tenor shorthand pro proved it. So this evolution of type writing system, for example, has improved and it will improve more and more, like motion capturing, voice recognition, and gesture capturing, and then finally, final goal is probably this direct brain cognitive system. Direct brain without using the voice or anything. There are two basic approach. One is non-invasive, such as using the infrared uh, sensors on the cap, you wear the cap, and then detect the activities, activity, activity of the brain. Sometimes even invasive technology for the very handicapped person, like she has the chip mounted inside of the brain, and then this, this machine can suck the vital signal and then convert it and then transmit it into this digital system so that she can manipulate this man-made hand. It's really unbelievable. This kind of technology is really getting advanced nowadays. Even mind reading technology is already practical. Here is the functional MRI, which is very common medical instrumentation in the hospital. And this guy is looking at this picture. And then, you know, this MRI can make the, the map activity, activity map of the brain. When, see, when this guy is seeing what kind of picture, what kind of part of the brain is activated by high resolution. So clarifying the data of the given pictures and then the reflected pictures of the brain, cut face of the brain activity, with a high power of this computation, so-called big data, they can reconstruct the vision like this high resolution. It's, it's really amazing, right? It's like you cannot hide. It's like you become the video coder. And this kind of machine, as, as any other technology, it can downsize and then it can be simplified. They finally end up at the headset like this. And it's so-called one big exit. Expected market is a neuro marketing. For example, this printing company designing the leaflet of of the you know, product, and she's wearing this, and when she is looking at this, this particular the article, uh oh, now she's, we got attention. Oh, now she goes into this interest. Now she decided to buy. So who doesn't want to have this machine, right? The brain is the market itself. Customer satisfaction is in the brain. So everybody wants to have this. Therefore, tons of budget they are investing if you conquer this technology for the first, that's a winner for sure. Even dream is now under the development of the visualization. It's completely the same mechanism. When you're sleeping, you, maybe this pillow is sucking this whatever the information from the brain, and it can visualize and record it. Maybe this, this man is dreaming of this pretty girl instead of this furniture or the food. You can't hide it. You gotta, you know, wear some, you know, iron helmet or something to hide yourself. It's so visible to the world. So basically, basically, this brain machine interface has a two big exits. One is that new, new neural marketing kind of neural blah 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 business, using this feedback of the vital cord. You can improve the marketing or the designing the stuff, what training process or anything. And the other exit is the brain blah, blah, blah business. You can directly manipulate the machine or even communicate, brain to brain communicate without using the voice expression or typing expression. It's like a telepathy, it's coming. Of course the resolution or the maturity is still poor, but theoretically, we can see the horizon already. So as time goes by, sophistication of the technology, this interface of the machine is coming towards our brain, closer to closer. It's almost thin paper, thin cross. At the same time, 
physically machine is getting close, as I mentioned, to be the wearable. That's the fate of the technology. It used to be both mobility gear or the information gear, that's butter. It used to be the furniture like stationary, becomes the handy mobile, then wearable. Let, let's take a look at this wearable robot. These are all already on the market in Japan. Wearable robot, many type of, types of the wearable robot. Depending on the market requirement, this HAL is the highest technology for the heavy patient, like handicapped person. It's assistive limb with that brain cognitive system inside. It's already practically available. They're selling. This is only one product selling on the market. This can, okay, just think. Move right leg, then this exkeraton system moves by itself instead of your real muscle. It's really like a future. So it's really like expensive like a Ferrari. But on the other hand, at the same time, this if the function is so much simpler with a reasonable price, other types of the simple wearable robot is already selling in Amazon. Let's take a look at this Panasonic. What they use is the electrical muscle stimulation system, EMS. You know this, you know, this kind of massaging machine, right? You know, just uh, put the gel pad on it and then stimulate the muscle and it moves. Using that technology, and then this, this machine has the motion sensor and the gyro sensor in it, so they can tell where is the center of mass now. And with the tons of the installed algorithm of this walking sequence, they can detect which timing now I am in, and then which muscle it has to shrink now, and which has to be you know, released the tension. So they have the sequence of the ideal walking. Once I wear it, this can lead me to the ideal walking. So it's appreciated by the purpose of this rehabilitation or even for the fitness purpose for the elderly person to go out because they can walk much smoother. And it's so cheap. It's already selling on Amazon. And the more advanced system is with this EMS, one exit is a possessed hand. Possessed hand, it's exactly the same system using this electric stimulation pad here. And in this co computer database, we collected a lot about how much stimulation can bend this index finger 30 degree or something. So what they can do out of this system is you can play the music without exercising. You see what I mean, right? Play the harp or play the piano. Of course, you have to adjust the initial position <laughs> by yourself, otherwise it's gonna be a mess, right? But it's totally sensational, right? And other exit, it's the same. But, you, okay, you have the same system here, and here is the peeler on the right hand and the avocado on the left hand. And you just download from their side, peeler, avocado peeler. Then it moves by itself. This is sensation. Because manualless life is coming. You know, that we, what we know is that you buy the new products, and you read the manual, and you learn how to use it, and then the try and error, you get graduate, gradually getting familiar with the machine. But this has the potential to be completely opposite. You just finger moves, and then you run from the finger. Again, this is still immature technology, so they have to improve a lot in the real you know, market scene, but Theoretically, how much impact it has, you can recognize it, right? And then there is already the test field of those compet competitions. Cybathlon, have you heard of it? Cybathlon is the event for the handicapped people, and it was, first Cybathlon was held in Switzerland, two, one month after the Rio de Janeiro Paralympic. It's almost like a Paralympic, but big difference is that you can use high technology as much as you want. Of course, there is a regulation like a Formula One, Formula Three, or something. Here is the left. This one is exactly like an electric stimulation system. This girl cannot move the muscle of the leg, but she was riding the bike. I was watching it. It's so exciting. My God, they are, they are riding. 
And if you don't have the reg, this artificial reg substitute you, and if you're more damaged, this x carton system makes you run. And if you are the, unfortunately, most handicapped person, here is a brain cognitive system. It was so cool. The pilots are lined up in front of this, uh, the table, and they are gazing at the display. They were running in the display. Their avatars are competing each other. It was so cool. They are, so if you can successfully concentrate and synchronize to the digital system, it boom accelerate. So this provides handicapped people a lot of pride as a top elite pilot. And at the same time, this is such a building opportunity of the new technology too. So I was talking about this technology, but function is a little bit different. This can be completely opposite motivation can fully bloom in the completely opposite direction. Like this assistive limb. Obviously this Lockheed Martin is interested in to make the soldier stronger. But Japanese, as I mentioned, Japanese biggest headache is a so this, this aging society. Our war front is not a real battle, but the real aging society. Therefore, we need a nurse stronger. We have to mass produce the stronger nurse to rescue this country. So as the dog, you know, we don't make the big dog, but instead we make the companion dog. And they are working in the nursing home of the elderly people's house to chat with them and they try protecting them from this, uh, what's that, becoming, you know, becoming, you know, losing the mind, right? Like Alzheimer. Even this humanoid robot, this our famous Asimo, can never grow up more than 130 centimeters. That's because Honda noticed it's gonna feel scary. So we don't make the scary robot Instead, we make the ambassador, so she, he, he was, she was doing a good job with the meeting with the pres, President Obama. The pet man don't care, right? His, his goal is to be the Terminator, so he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I was talking about this neurotechnology, and there is a big exit of this uh, serious operational marketing, neuromarketing, or that manipulating this man-made hand or something. Of course, that's the biggest expected market, but that, that's why they are all rushing into this market. And it's so-called rest, red ocean is coming, and it, it's gonna be soon, the cost performance war. And usually, then what we do is that think opposite. Function innovation is op different. And then here is the, my favorite innovation from Japan, using this neurotechnology is it's Neko Mimi. Neko Mimi is a cat ear. What does it do? Okay, you are, you are, you're the girl, you're shy, you go to the party, and there is a cool guy, and I'm interested in him, but I can't serve because he's shy. So that instead of you, this can support your facial, you know, the communication. So as tail they develop too. And it's cheap, it's already, 5,900 yen in Japan is selling on the market. <laughs> you know, using this brain, whatever. You know, simple function and then reasonable price. It's silly. But, you know, going into this red ocean is very important to, it's a volume zone. But as you, what I wanted to tell you is innovation, function innovation is how, what kind of practical market appreciating, appreciating value. And the Japanese market, I don't know if it's Germany or India, do anybody appreciate this or not, but there are so many hobby boy, guy, boys or girls in Japan, so therefore this kind of machine appear. So speech recognition, hands-free, you know, so must be, you know, the exercising of this kind of technology. Of course it's necessary, and you gotta do that. What is this call center too? What's the opposite, again? Here is the uh, telecommunication company's laboratory made a prototype. This is a business meeting. And then here is the, uh, on the ceiling, there is a voice recognition robot hugging. 
What does it do? This is a typical business meeting. This CEO is talking too much, right? Then what happened? Is I don't know what he's talking, but for sure you're talking too much. That's what he can do. And then this girl next to him didn't say a single word in this whole meeting yet. Then he can tell she should talk a little more. So, you know, there is a famous joke about the International Congress conference. And the chairman, if the good chairman is, the, you know, the controlling the, the meeting, he or she can let the poor Japanese talk and at the same time keep the noisy Indian silent, <laughs> right? So that's what you know. And then if the person is doing this, it's kind of, you know, the hesitating and it troubles up. So that this machine is like uh, assisting the chairman system to make a smooth and whatever good meeting. So again, this is silly, you, you might think, but this must contain some kind of totally opposite direction. You know, this, this side, everybody think of it from the day one of this voice recognition technology. So that you gotta win about this cost performance war and this business strategy. But on the other side, there's always, there are many opposite words of, of the operation. So I was talking about four topics today. First topic, remember, this mental barrier is so big, and usually engineers underestimate this psychological part, liberal art. Second topic, I was talking about the human performance. You know, designers' imagination, no matter how much he or she thinks, this perform, or we can perform a lot beyond the imagination. So do not underestimate the human's redundancy. The third topic was brain as the ultimate interface. There are two exits. One is a neurofeedback system for to improve the marketing or the training or anything. And the one other exit is manipulating directory. The machine sometimes, sometimes the communication directory, telepathy, right? And then lastly, I was talking about the relationship between this technology and the function. And then it tend to be always go flooding into this operational war. But okay, let's stop a little moment. What's the opposite word of this operation? There are many opposite words. And I was just talking about the Japanese opposite word. It's usually mild and weak and whatever. In one word, it's hobby board direction. That's a Japanese you know, mentality. So going through this man and machine interface there are lots of insights you might get, it, right? And I hope uh, this can lead you some kind of innovation on your work. Thank you very much.